excellent time to uh, talk about this show and discuss how um, it, it is constructed, the characters, its relation to American history. And of course, being me, I'm going to uh, talk about it in terms of a uh, Shakespeare play, specifically Shakespeare's histories. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the uh, what a history play is, how Hamilton, I would argue, is uh, part of the history play tradition. And as the show itself posits, who writes history? Who lives, who dies, and who tells your story? So we're going to start off, um, I'm going to... Um, yeah, um, uh, to get an informed opinion about the show, um, who better to discuss it than the president? Good evening. <laughs> Seven years ago, a young man came to a poetry jam that Michelle and I held at the White House. He took the mic and said that he was going to perform a song from something he was working on about the life of somebody who embodies hip hop. America's first treasury secretary. <laughs> I confess, we all laughed, but who's laughing now? <laughs> Seven years later, Hamilton has become not only a smash hit, but a civics lesson our kids can't get enough of. One with fierce, youthful energy. One where rap is the language of revolution, and hip hop, its urgent soundtrack. It's a musical about the miracle that is America, a place of citizenship, where we debate ideas with passion and conviction, a place of inclusiveness, where we value our boisterous diversity as a great gift. A place of opportunity, where no matter how humble our origins, we can make it if we try. That's the story of America, an experiment that is not yet finished, a project that belongs to all of us. America is what we, the people, make of it. As long as we stay just like our country, young, scrappy, and hungry. That's the story of Hamilton. And you get to see it coming up. So, as the president said, this show is a love letter to both Hamilton and the uh, um, and of the idea of America. And this is something that all history plays do. But in particular, it's what um, history uh, plays do. Um, you can see in this quote from uh, the 1960s book uh, um, Shakespeare Library by uh, Marxist critic uh, Jan Cott. Every historical period finds something in a Shakespeare play, what they are looking for. And um, um, a reader interprets the text, whether Richard III or Ham uh, Hamilton, um, based on their own life experience. They cannot mm -hmm. otherwise. Um, this, uh, I think, is important to think about when you're uh, considering this play. Um, but if you're looking at Shakespeare's histories, and he wrote 10 history plays from 1593 to about uh, 1613, what exactly is a history play? It's actually more complicated than you might think because it's not necessarily historically accurate. It's not necessarily about a historical event. And it's not necessarily a, com a story of a hero. Uh, Shakespeare's most popular history play is about a villainous hunchbacked cripple um, who takes the throne by slaughtering his way to the top and then is uh, killed by the end of the play and replaced by Henry VII. Um, I would say, looking at all of Shakespeare's history plays, what the main feature, uh, um, they look before and after historical events, uh, sure. window. Uh, a sense of uh, uh, identity for the, um, uh, for the country, and uphold some form of national virtue, and it celebrates the contributions of individual people. Unfortunately, they can also serve as propaganda. Um, Shakespeare didn't invent the history genre. If you look here, we have um, three, co uh, three different history plays, two of which uh, are about the same king. And um, um, one of them uh, was written by um, Shakespeare, and, but this one was not. This one is called The mm -hmm. Tragedies of Richard III is played by the Queen's Men before uh, Shakespeare became a, a, um, a playwright. Um, these plays, as the name implies, they were put on by the Queen's own company and they mainly served as propaganda pieces. They were designed to create a sense of national identity in the wake of numerous assassination attempts upon the Queen's life and the Spanish Armada, which threatened England itself. Um, 
so you can see how they were designed mainly to boister national morale and to get the English um, on the side of the British monarchy. Um, so the, the characters before Shakespeare got his hand on Richard III, they were very wooden and they were uh, taken from sources that were even more wooden. Um, his main source was a, a, a story called uh, um, uh, The uh, True Tre... Well, sorry, um, uh, by a guy named Polydor Virgil who wrote um, more than 20 years after Richard's death. Um, that said, um, what Shakespeare did was he fleshed out these cardboard cutout uh, uh, propaganda pieces and created um, three-dimensional characters. What Lin-Manuel Miranda did when he created Hamilton was he did the same thing but in reverse because of course he had a wealth of information. He had Hamilton's own journals, he had his published letters, his public his works like the Pet Federalist Papers, interviews with uh, his fellow soldiers, his friends and family and people who knew him, and of course every single American history textbook at his disposal. So, but what Miranda did was instead of creating a really complicated historically accurate piece that is uh, um, as right down to the exact uh, micron, he created a universal story about the American dream. As, the, as President Obama said, Hamilton is a celebration of America, just like um, uh, Shakespeare's history plays were celebrations of English national identity. Um, Miranda has said that this is a story about America then, told by America now, and we want to eliminate any distance between a contemporary audience and this story. And part of that meant was trying to make it accessible to, uh, to people nowadays. Now, there has been a little bit of controversy people, uh, by people confused about the fact that Lynn Manuel Miranda, who, has, uh, uh, who is a Puerto Rican American, why he's playing Alexander Hamilton, um, why half the cast is, uh, why very few of the, uh, um, the cast are actually Caucasian, even though they're, they're playing Caucasian figures. This is what we in the theater refer to as colorblind casting. And it, um, it serves, as he says, to eliminate distance between the source material and the, um, and the audience. It's, a t and it's an attempt to make the story more relevant to more groups of people. This is not a new idea, and I'm proud to say it's, it's not a new idea in, when it comes to performing Shakespeare either. Um, if you look on the left, this is a still from Orson Welles' production of Macbeth uh, in 1936. During the Depression, obviously a lot of people were out of work, and uh, one group that was hit particularly hard were uh, African-American actors. So. Um, Orson Welles created an all um, a, a production of Macbeth that was entirely um, composed of African American actors, and he he just justified it by setting the play in Haiti instead of uh, uh, setting in uh, medieval Scotland. Um, more recently, Patrick Stewart wished to um, give more work to African American actors, but also wished to play the character of Othello, who Shakespeare writes as a African American, but he himself wanted to play it without resorting to blackface, as actors have unfortunately resorted to for hundreds of years. Um, his solution was what was called the photo negative Othello where Patrick Stewart was the only white man on stage and all the traditionally white roles were played by African-Americans. You can see how in this particular case, it gets the audience to think about the prejudices that Othello goes through. We as the, the white audience members might think about um, uh, the persecution of African-Americans as we see a, a, uh, a white man persecuted by a bunch of uh, people who are a different color. Flipping it on its head gives it a different context and hopefully engages the story. As I said, there are controversies about the show, especially recently with the um, um, controversy of Black Lives Matter um, and, the, uh, um, and the ongoing uh, debate about police brut brutality and systemic racism in our country. People have often pointed out that Hamilton is not a uh, perfect figure. He was, in fact, he did not own slaves, but he did help procure the slaves for his uh, wife's family. And people have rightly questioned whether we should be celebrating in this man or figures like Thomas Jefferson or, um, or Washington in light of their slaveholding past. Manuel Miranda dis, uh, defends this statement by saying, first of all, every character in our show is complicit in slavery in some way or another. 
You cannot uh, uh, tell the story of, uh, of American history without addressing this. The show does not shy away from the, the, the question, but it does, it does smooth certain aspects away in order to make it a, a, a more tightly compacted story. I would argue that it is perfectly uh, legitimate and appropriate for us to try and separate um, a, the actual history of the founding of our country with the, um, the story that he is trying to tell. Again, with Richard III, I am well aware that the real Richard of Gloucester was not a hunchback, probably didn't kill his nephews, was nowhere near the villainous psychopath that Shakespeare uh, dramatizes, and yet I still see merit to the story of Shakespeare, that Shakespeare produces. Even though it was in, um, started as a propaganda piece, it is a, a powerful story about the abuses of power. Just like Hamilton, is, um, though it does not get every historical detail right, it is intended to be a celebration of Americans' ideals um, and to give hope and, uh, and inspiration for people to continue fighting towards those ideals, even though we have yet to realize them. What do I mean by uh, American ideals? Right there on the screen. We hold these troops to be self-evident that all men are created equal. We all know that when Thomas Jefferson wrote those words, he intentionally, uh, he actually meant white male um, property owners but those words have been challenged and redefined through the centuries. And a show like Hamilton can show us where we came from and where we still have to go. So this is the virtue of the history play. It is not intended to be a historically accurate dep depiction, but it does celebrate the ideals of a country and help uh, um, inspire us to continue to fight for them. Now, the character of Hamilton is fascinating because, as the Bard says, one man in his time plays many parts, and every scene of the musical, he, ha he plays a different role. So let's go over some of them, and I'll take, I'll highlight the similarities to certain Shakespearean archetypes. First off, um, when we first meet Hamilton, he is an immigrant. He was born in the West Indies, he emigrated to New York, and then he, knowing that he had little prospects, he becomes George Washington's aide-de-camp, which basically means his secretary. But this was an extremely important position because his job was to write to Congress, making them aware of what was happening during the war. So when people were resorting, when Washington soldiers were resorting to, for instance, bandaging their feet with cloth because they didn't have shoes, or eating their own horses, um, Hamilton's job was to tell people, uh, the Congress that we need more help and we need resources. So it was extremely important. He also helped to uh, command the, uh, during the Battle of Yorktown, the final battle of the, of the Revolutionary War. Um, Hamilton, I think, during war resembles uh, Shakespeare's Hotspur, a young, fiery um, uh, uh, young soldier who uh, attempts to uh, overthrow the throne of England um, and uh, is uh, eventually defeated by uh, King uh, Henry V. But everybody, including the king himself, um, uh, admires his bravery and his convictions. After the war, Hamilton becomes a pioneer of American government. He becomes the first Secretary of the Treasury, where he was uh, um, instrumental in creating America's banking system. This is why he's on the $10 bill. Um, he, uh, uh, looking at the slavery debate for a second, Hamilton was a member of the Manumission Society, a group of people that wanted to phase slavery out gradually so that it wouldn't result in the ruination of uh, the Southern planter class's uh, economy. Um, it's possible that Hamilton attempt, uh, uh, Hamilton's banking system was an attempt to consolidate America's wealth in the banks in order to create economic relief so that hopefully it would be possible to relieve slavery without resorting to civil war. But that's just conjecture. The point is that his, um, his banking system was in direct opposition to the, uh, the slaveholding planter class in, in the South. And that's why Thomas Jefferson is an antagonist in the show. But what I want to talk about is his similarity to a Shakespearean character in Shakespeare's final history play, Cardinal Wolsey in Henry VIII. I know a lot about this character because I played him back in 2008. In both cases, 
both men, Woolsey and Hamilton, control the finances of, uh, of the country. And they receive a lot of abuse and a lot of enmity because of that. You, if you look at this painting, if you see the courtiers on this side, you see those jealous, envious, furious faces. This is how Shakespeare dramatizes the relationship between the king and the cardinal. In Hamilton and Henry VIII, the king and the president seem utterly aloof, utterly blameless, and utterly um, unassailable uh, when it comes to criticism. It's Hamilton and Woolsey who in their respective plays are brought down. And they were both are brought down by financial scandal, real and imagined. So what I love about both plays is that um, in, when the characters are confronted with political scandal, they have this beautiful image-rich soliloquy. In Hamilton's case, he sings about a hurricane. Um, it's not always made clear, but um, Hamilton's house was destroyed in 1773 by a hurricane in the West Indies. This, is, this was particularly uh, relevant to Lin-Manuel Miranda because his parents are Puerto Rican, an island that is continually ravaged by hurricanes. In fact, he famously said that um, he would um, perform Hamilton at Congress's house if they could uh, provide uh, financial relief to uh, Puerto Rico after their uh, um, uh, most recent hurricane. Um, Hamilton regards his political scandal when he was found out and accused of embezzlement as being in the eye of a hurricane. And this is what leads him to write the Reynolds pamphlet. In Wolsey's case, when he is found out that he was actually bribing cardinals in order to become the Pope, he compares himself to a setting sun saying, I have touched the highest point of all my greatness and from that full meridian of my glory, I haste me to my setting. These scandals um, end Hamilton and Woolsey's careers, but it does not end their lives. For that, we have to look at the duels between Hamilton and Burr. Um, or, in Shakespeare's case, between Hotspur and Prince Hal. There have been articles written that compare Burr and Hamilton to Hotspur and Hal before. Ha Burr is pre presented as sort of Machiavellian. He keeps his political views to himself he, he succeeds by uh, being kind of middle of the road and not uh, uh, aligning himself by, to any controversial opinion. But when Hamilton uh, vote, uh, endorses Jefferson in the war of uh, the election of 18, they, um, their disagreement turns violent. And in this uh, fight rehearsal for Henry uh, IV, what's very interesting about the play is some that of the dueling set up so clearly in opposition for the whole play, and the only time that they meet uh, is is in this, the context of the battle. It's always very exciting when Trevor rushes onto the stage to sort of finally have that feeling of a showdown. The show builds up to that point to a certain extent, and um, you have to deliver uh, a really good fight, which is a great challenge and a really exciting thing. And Terry has done an amazing job. Uh, not only technically structuring the fight, but also um, structuring it in a way that helps tell the story of who these two characters are, Hotspur and Hal, and what got them to this place, and, and why what happens in the fight happens. You take the actors and cooperate with them and the director and make up the fight, make up the moves of the fight so that you arrange the fight in a way that you think and they think and everybody thinks will um, serve the purpose, if you like. Well, you have to find the kind of the narrative of, of what they would do, the, the, the story of their, why they've got to the point where words fail and violence ensues. So like they said, words fail and violence ensues. This, uh, the, um, um, this is what happens when uh, um, Hamilton and Burr no longer have a, a, uh, the ability to rationally discourse. But the tragedy, of course, is that um, when Burr kills Hamilton, he finds himself recast and obliterated, and his legacy obliterated by history. If you look at this, this piece of fan art in the, in the, uh, um, on the left side, what does this pot of ink say? Villain. Um, Burr mourns the fact that he has now been vilified by history, which brings me to my last point. 
who lives, who dies, and who tells your story. <laughs> in all of history plays, the characters are aware of the fact that they are making hi history. What sets Hamilton apart is that it is, um, it is aware of who writes history. Hamilton um, was vilified by uh, people like Thomas Jefferson during his life, and that's why we hardly talked about him until the show. Um, in the case of uh, Shakespeare, let's not forget that he wrote a story based on Tudor, Tudor chroniclers who obliterated the legacy of people like Richard III. So it is very important nowadays to think of history not as an all-powerful um, uh, text that was uh, given to us by Jove himself, but as the result of the flawed recollections of people with a bias and with an axe to grind. My favorite example of this, and I'm not going to play this clip, I'm afraid, you'll have to look for it yourself, of how history is retold in the show is in the song Satisfied, where Angelica Schuyler, where first we see this wonderful meeting between uh, Eliza Schuyler and Hamilton at a, at a dance, and then Angelica Schuyler literally rewinds the entire scene and plays it again from her point of view. And it creates an entirely different significance to the song and to their relationship. This is an example of how history can mean different things to different people. Another example later in the show is the song Burn, where after Hamilton commits infidelity, um, she find, uh, his wife finds the letters that he wrote to her during this period and sets them on fire. This was based on something that, uh, um, on the fact that no letters or correspondence survive. Lynn Manuel Miranda admitted that uh, he knew he was aware of this fact, and he doesn't. We don't know whether they they were lost to history, or Hamilton kept them, or they were lost, or if they were literally burned. But it is an important dramatic device because the narrative changes once those letters are destroyed. Um, similar. And speaking of narratives, when Hamilton proposes to um, Eliza Schuyler, what does she say? She says, I want to be part of the narrative. I want to be part of the story of American history, which you are helping to write. The most dramatic example of history being um, written in a kind of chaotic and unexpected ways is the way that Washington talks about his legacy. Um, this is a little bit of art that I created myself. Um, Washington reminds me uh, when he taught in the song, Who, um, History Has His Eyes On You, um, he says, you have no control over who lives and who dies and who tells your story. Washington is acutely aware of this because he doesn't know the end of the, his own story. Is he going to succeed the Revolutionary War or is he going to fail? He has a, uh, a, a, his song kind of reminds me of a speech from Henry IV, one of the ones that has um, Shakespeare's most famous line about kingship, uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. Now, I won't read the whole thing, but, he's, but you notice it says, why well, might read the book of fate and see the revolution of the times? He's talking about fate, but he could just as easily be talking about history and how if you knew what, how history is going to report on you, probably you wouldn't like what you see. Ultimately, history is written by people who have a vested interest. And until recently, Hamilton was consigned to oblivion. Fortunately, the women in his story helped preserve that. Um, as uh, we see at the end of the show, Eliza H Hamilton collects all his letters, interviews his fellow soldiers, um, helps raise funds for the Washington Monument, um, and helps and starts the first uh, uh, orphanage in uh, um, New York City, which helps perpetuate his legacy. Um, and you'll see Hamilton, this is a function of uh, history to give a sense of immortality to mortal men. And you'll notice in this letter, which um, that I, I put on here, this is a real letter, the final letter that he wrote to Eliza before his duel with Burr. I hope uh, for redeeming grace and divine mercy, and a happy immortality. The greatest legacy that Hamilton has been given is that he, his work has come to life by such a talented writer and such a talented cast and such an amazing world-changing musical. 
So I can think of no better tribute. Is it the most historical, ac historically accurate tributes to Hamilton's life? No, but it is by far the most inspiring and I would argue the most Shakespearean. And I'm very glad that it exists and that so many people have gotten a chance to see it. Okay, that is the end of my talk. Uh, in uh, just, uh, uh, just two minutes, I'll, I'll re-invite you guys for the talk back. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much.